The internet is a vast place. Nearly any question that comes to mind can be answered with a simple keystroke. Any curiosity can be quelled with a simple search term. And yet, when we hit enter and look upon the very answer we sought out to find, many of us experience a very peculiar kind of cognitive dissonance. The answer you sought out is grotesque and disturbing. And yet, you can't look away, and you don't know why. It's almost like coming to grips with our morbid reality is a task fit for no one. Nestled in between Nepal and China is the tallest peak in the world. And for that very prominent feature, Mount Everest has become a destination for all those who want to test their might. Whether to prove to others or to themselves, these people climb this mountain not only to experience the highest point on the planet, but to also experience the euphoria of conquering a piece of terrain that has taken many lives. Mount Everest is 8,848 meters tall, or 29,000 feet. And unfortunately for many people who attempted this climb, they wouldn't even make it halfway up the mountain before succumbing to its harsh environment and subsequently being left to die on the side of a mountain, their body forever frozen in perpetuity. So to begin today's video, I'm going to talk about one of these unfortunate souls who made the brave attempt to climb this inhospitable mountain. This is Donald Lynn Cash. He's 55 years old and he's from Utah and he was a hiking enthusiast, specifically mountain hiking. He would share most of his adventures on social media, where not only he would share his literal hiking experiences, but also occasionally sharing his thoughts and feelings about hiking in general. Before his attempt at summiting Mount Everest, he chose to take a sabbatical from his job so that he would have ample opportunity and time to prep and train for this hike. It was something that he was looking forward to. Attempting to summit Mount Everest was his overall goal when it came to mountain hiking. He enjoyed the hobby, but he knew that this was the mountain to hike the summit to conquer. All the other mountains that he hiked, all the other adventures that he went on, simply gave him the training necessary to climb Mount Everest. And on May 2nd, 2019, he finally got on the flight to Nepal and was ready to conquer this mountain. To truly understand what happened to Don Cash, you need to know that there's certain portions of the mountain that are extra challenging. One of those portions is Hillary Step. This portion of Mount Everest is a nearly vertical rock face with a height around 12 meters or 40 feet. It's located on the southeast ridge, halfway between the south summit and the true summit. And this step of the mountain is considered the most technically challenging. The vertical nature of this step makes it incredibly difficult to climb, on top of the fact that it's also within the death zone of the mountain, which is a section of Mount Everest that has very low levels of oxygen, which makes climbing this portion incredibly difficult. Your bones and muscles will begin to ache as you climb this portion of the mountain, making every movement laborious and incredibly calculated. The low pressure environment within the death zone is the reason why you can't breathe, and many people unfortunately have died on this step because of the immense physical strain and hypoxia. It's frighteningly easy for many climbers to finish climbing over the step and then unknowingly stepping off the side of the mountain because of the delirium that hypoxia causes and the overall strain and exhaustion that many of these climbers face and experience after going over this step. Don Cash knew of all of the risk. He was aware of just how difficult this climb would be, and his family absolutely supported him. In fact, the last message that he sent to his wife before he embarked on this journey was to thank her and the children that they share for all of their support for him, and understanding that this attempt at summiting Mount Everest was something that he wanted to do all of his life. He would be one of many to start that climb on May 22nd. And it was noted that the Sherpas, the people who would help him climb that mountain, were a little bit strained. The conditions on the mountain that day were harsh, but everybody trekked on, and everything seemed fine. He was even able to climb Hillary Step without any trouble. And within a short period of time, Don Cash was able to summit the mountain, but something was horribly wrong. Even though Don Cash was an avid hiker, he was 55, and for whatever reason, that final trek all the way up until the summit took everything out of him. And unfortunately, after taking all of the photos and experiencing the summit, on the way down, near Hillary Step, Don Cash had a heart attack. And in any other circumstance, a heart attack, a sudden heart attack, is manageable. But this occurred in the death zone. He simply did not have enough time to be properly stabilized and taken down the mountain. It simply wasn't possible. So among all the people that he had spent weeks climbing with, among all of the Sherpas that helped him get to the mountain, Don Cash would die. He would succumb to the cardiac arrest and his body has been left on the mountain. There was an opportunity for him to be taken down off of the mountain, but his family wanted him to remain there. 
They wanted him to stay on the very mountain that he had spent his entire life trying to summit. His family, even while mourning, made sure to celebrate the success of him summiting the mountain, even if he didn't survive on the way down. I'm sure many of us know exactly where we were on September 11, 2001. Everyone has a story. Everyone has feelings about what happened, even after 22 years. Many people experienced incredible levels of anxiety, fear, and paranoia after that terrible event. The world was simply different after what happened in New York. So imagine for a moment, you're a New Yorker, and it's November 12th, 2001. With the memory and trauma of 9-11 only two months behind you, Imagine turning on the television and seeing the fire, destruction, and carnage left in Queens after another plane fell out the sky. An American Airlines plane crashes in a Queens neighborhood moments after taking off from JFK Airport. All 255 people on board are believed dead. Six others on the ground are missing. And tonight, federal investigators on the scene trying to figure out how and why. It was a neighborhood in flames and chaos. 12 homes hit by the wreckage, at least four burned to the ground after American Airlines Flight 587 en route to Santo Domingo crashed in Bell Harbor, Queens, moments after taking off from Kennedy Airport. Nerves frayed still from September 11th. It was a traumatic and devastating sight for the people who saw it come down. I walk in the top of the roof and I see the piece. The engine fell down first and after that the band of the, the truck go all the way in over here. I see my eyes and I scream, everybody go out! Transformers sparked as neighbors helped firefighters pull hoses. Nearby, one of the plane's engines had broken off and landed on the property of a gas station just feet away from the gas tanks. The owner tried to put the fire out with a garden hose. American Airlines Flight 587 was a regularly scheduled international passenger flight from JFK International Airport to Las Americas International Airport in Santo Domingo, located in the Dominican Republic. The plane was an Airbus A300 that was built in 1988. And on November 12th, there were 260 people on board of the plane, nine of those people being crew members. The two pilots who were flying this plane were Captain Edward States, who was 42 years old, and 34-year-old Sten Molin, who was actually flying the entire time. The flight was cleared to take off at 9.11 a.m. Eastern Time, and wouldn't leave the runway until 9.14 a.m. Around 9.15 a.m., the captain made initial contact with the departure controller, informing him that the airplane was around 1,300 feet in the air, and climbing to about 5,000 feet. The controller instructed the aircraft to climb and maintain 13,000 feet, and the flight data recorder showed that the events leading to the crash began when the aircraft hit wake turbulence from another passenger airplane that was just ahead. In response to the turbulence, Mullen moved the rudder to the right and then to the left and then back again in quick succession. These sudden movements caused the vertical stabilizer to separate from the aircraft, and it fell into Jamaica Bay, about one mile away from the wreckage site. Almost immediately after the vertical stabilizer was separated from the plane, the aircraft pitched downward. The pilot struggled to control the aircraft. It had entered into a flat spin because of the loss of the vertical stabilizer. And because of that spin, aerodynamic loads were placed on both engines of the aircraft. The engines couldn't take the stress, and they were sheared off the aircraft, subsequently being tossed north and east of the main wreckage site. The sudden loss of both engines cut power to the FDR, or flight data recorder, and that moment was timestamped, specifically at 9.16 a.m. The cockpit voice recorder was still running at the time, but it was running on emergency energy, and once that was gone, it stopped at 9.16, only a couple seconds after the loss of both engines. And the last recorded words captured by the cockpit voice recorder were absolutely chilling. Both pilots were terrified, and the final recording, even though it was short, captured in its entirety their fear and desperation. Officer Sten Molin was the first to appear on the recording. What the hell are we into? We're stuck in it! These words were said while Sten Molin was trying to break out of the flat spin. Quickly, the second pilot, Captain Edward States, would interject. Get out of it! Get out of it! And it would only be moments until the plane slammed into the ground at Newport Avenue and Beach 131st Street, located in Queens. On board Flight 587, 246 passengers, nine crew members, all presumed dead. Hospitals near the crash site did take injuries, but most of them were firefighters who got hurt putting down the blaze and looking for survivors. Just uh, dangerous work, falling, slipping, cutting. It's a lot of sharp material from the fuselage and everything. Firefighters quickly found the flight data recorder in good condition. It was taken to Washington for analysis to find out exactly what was going on on board Flight 587 
as it was crashing to the ground in Queens. Because the crash took place only two months after the attacks against New York and the World Trade Center, it was easy for everyone to assume that this was another politically motivated attack against either the U.S. government or U.S. civilians. But those rumors and assumptions were dashed immediately. The NTSB investigation that occurred immediately after this crash was able to easily prove that this was just a freak accident, that all of the loss of life was unintentional and the direct result of occurrences that were out of anyone's control. The victims of this event were mostly passengers of the plane. In total, 265 people lost their lives to this unfortunate event, five of those people being on the ground. Those five people were either in their homes or on the street when this passenger airplane suddenly fell out the sky. Of the people on the ground who were nearby the crash site, many actually saw the moment when the plane lost both of its engines. They noted seeing two puffs of fire and then seeing the plane lose control, entering a flat spin and crashing into Queens, New York. This is Fan Mei Yi. She was born in 1976 in Shenzhen, China, and her life was not easy. She was abandoned by her family as a child, resulting in her being raised in an all-girls orphanage. And when she turned 15, she was told to leave the orphanage because they had an age restriction. And from that point, she was homeless. And like many who live on the street, unfortunately, she became addicted to drugs. And after a while, she needed to feed that addiction. And being uneducated and a teenager, Fan Mei Yi only had one option to make any sort of money. She began selling her body, specifically to support her methamphetamine addiction. Along with selling her body at night, she would also participate in petty crime to get any sort of money to feed her addiction. It wouldn't be until she was 21 when she was taken in by a brothel, and then had some level of consistent work. And right around the same time, she would meet her future husband. He was a frequent customer of hers, and his name was Ng Chen Yuan. Ng was a drug addict and an abuser. Once they were married, the abuse only got worse, and many of Fan and Ng's neighbors would note how loud their apartment was, and how every night there would be sounds of abuse. This would be Fan's life all of 1996, all the way up until 1997, when she would meet another person named Chan Man Lok. They would meet and converse only because he was a customer, a fan. Chan Man Lok was 34 years old, and he was a socialite. He would frequently spend money with Fan and also do methamphetamine with her, with many of these meth binges lasting days. During one of the many binges that Fan had with Chan, she noticed that Chan would leave his wallet out during their sessions together, so she chose to steal that wallet. And to her surprise and the surprise of her husband, she had stolen $4,000. Quickly, Fan realized the severity of her actions and attempted to pay Chan back. She gave him most of her earnings from working at the brothel to pay him back, on top of giving Chan $10,000. And from there, she thought the transaction was done. She thought that she was able to repair the damages. But unfortunately, she was unaware as to why Chan was a socialite and why Chan had access to illegal drugs and copious amounts of money. It was because he was a loan shark and he wanted interest on top of the money that she stole. Fan would also learn that on top of being a loan shark, Chan was a major drug dealer, specifically for the Triads, which was and still is a large criminal organization in Hong Kong. A year later, on March 17, 1999, Chan decided that Fan needed to be dealt with. He felt disrespected after being stolen from, so Chan ordered two members of the Triads, Luang Sheng Cho and Luang Wei Lun, to abduct Fan from her home and commit some of the worst acts of violence against her imaginable. Some time had passed since Fan seen Chang in person. At this point of her life in 1999, she had quit drugs and had divorced her husband. She even tried to find some legitimate work outside of the brothel. But her life was still incredibly difficult. She was still incredibly poor, looking for work outside of selling her body. And this left her alone and vulnerable to what was about to happen. The two Triad gang members would abduct Fan from her apartment and then quickly transported her to Chan's apartment on Granville Road in Hong Kong. The apartment had five bedrooms and was completely covered in Hello Kitty products, such as bed sheets, curtains, stuffed toys. These decorations were put up to soothe Fan's mind, to make her feel comfortable, because the plan was to force her to work at the brothel until she paid off her debt, a debt that would never be fully repaid. It would continue to increase as long as she was working under Chan. But this was only the plan. 
what actually happened to Fan was even worse. The two gang members and a 13-year-old girl decided that Fan would be better as a punching bag. They had fun in torturing her. They used every sadistic method of torture that they could imagine against her. And one of the individuals who was torturing her probably didn't have a choice. The 13-year-old girl who participated in this gruesome torture was brought in by Luang Wei Loon. And this grown man was actually in a relationship with this 13-year-old girl. She would periodically come in and out of the apartment to help torture Fan. During her imprisonment, she was tortured and assaulted. According to one source, she was beaten with metal bars, sometimes being strung up and used as a punching bag, and on one occasion, she was kicked in the head 50 times. Spices were rubbed into Fan's wounds, her legs and feet were burned with candle wax and hot plastic. Specifically, after the candle wax and hot plastic, she was left permanently maimed to such an extent that she couldn't walk anymore. And if that wasn't already terrible, she was then forced to consume human waste and was forced to smile and say that she enjoyed the beatings. If she refused, they subjected her to even harsher torture. Specifically, the kitchen in the apartment became the torturer's favorite place to find anything they could to inflict pain. Every tool, every utensil, anything that you can find in a kitchen, they used on fan. One of the ways that they burned her with plastic was by melting drinking straws and dripping the melting plastic on her legs and feet. And to reiterate, they did this because they just wanted to. They did this because they found it funny. Over time, Fan would become more and more weak as the torture became more and more severe. And between April 14th and April 15th of 1999, Fan succumbed to her wounds and died of traumatic shock. Upon the discovery of Fan's body, her captors dismembered and boiled the remains. Her skull was sewed inside of a Hello Kitty doll filled with dead insects while the rest of her body was discarded. Only her skull, one tooth, and some internal organs were recovered. They were found in a plastic bag. The triad members really thought they got away with it. They thought that nobody would look for someone who has no next of kin and was living on the street for most of her life. But the 13-year-old girl felt guilty. She felt scared, specifically of a spirit, Fan Mei Yi's spirit. She was being haunted by this woman, a woman that she helped kill. And that's what motivated her to go to the police and reveal everything. And that's exactly how the police discovered the Hello Kitty doll that had Fan Mei Yi's head sewed inside of it. It wouldn't be long until the police officers tracked down the gang members and Chang for this murder. The 13-year-old girl, who was only named as Lao, gave up everything. At the time of the arrest, Chan was living with his wife, A Pui. The apartment was raided by SWAT officers on the early morning hours of May 28th. Chang was immediately arrested, but the two other gang members were already out of China. But they would be found quickly by Interpol and extradited back to Hong Kong. It wouldn't be until December 7th, 2000 when the trial actually began. And it was a quick affair. They were all found guilty of manslaughter. This was because the jury was not unanimous in their opinion about whether or not this was actually murder. A few members of the jury believed that she only died of a drug overdose and not of torture, with arguments being that they didn't mean to kill her, they only meant to keep her alive to continue to torture her. Lau, the 13-year-old, was given immunity as long as she testified in court about what happened, and she told the entire story with all of the details. During the trial, Chang and Luang Xing Cho denied killing Fan, although they did not deny dismembering her body. Chan's wife also knew about the torture and she also testified in court. And after all of the arguments were made and all the testimonies were given, the three men involved in this deplorable act were found guilty. And they were sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole. And before the three men left the court, the judge had this to say, never in Hong Kong in recent years has a court heard of such cruelty, depravity, callousness, brutality, violence, and viciousness. These men were completely remorseless. The Google Earth program was released in 2001, and many people are familiar with its utility. I'm sure many of us became aware of the program when we were children, and the first thing we did was search up our home. There's something incredibly fascinating about seeing a home, something that you are familiar with, in a whole new perspective. Now, imagine if on a random day while searching on Google Earth, you found something odd in your neighborhood. Something so out of place, yet you wouldn't be able to see it if you didn't have this new perspective, if you didn't have the bird's eye view. On September 13th, 2019, a Florida resident did that very thing and discovered that there was a car submerged in a lake in their backyard. Little did this Florida resident know that during a random day on the internet, he solved a 22-year-old disappearance case. 
In November of 1997, a man named William Moult went missing. He was 40 years old at the time, and his disappearance was incredibly sudden. His girlfriend was actually expecting him to come home that night. Instead, she came home to an empty house. And it wouldn't be until 22 years later that his car was pulled out of this lake and his skeletal remains were recovered. Police officers and investigators were able to piece together what happened. Apparently, William Moult had driven into the lake by accident and unfortunately drowned. And because his disappearance was so sudden back in 1997, his case was shelved. There simply wasn't enough information to seek out any leads that would help in his discovery. And the most interesting thing about this event is that if the conditions weren't right, if this Florida resident didn't use Google Earth, coupled with the fact that the lake in his backyard was actually shallow due to a lack of rain, William Moult's body would have never been discovered. His car would have never been seen, and his family would have never received closure. This is your conventional parachute. It's a device used to slow down the motion of an object through an atmosphere by creating drag, or aerodynamic lift. People who use this device are typically those who skydive or base jump. And most of the time, the parachute works, especially if it's used properly. For example, if you were to open up your parachute too late, it will deploy. But at a low altitude, there's simply not enough time for the parachute to capture enough air to slow down your fall. And many people have broken their limbs or lost their lives because of an improper use of a parachute. But that's within your control. As long as you know how to use a parachute, you should be fine. But what's the likelihood of a parachute not functioning properly? You see, the likelihood of that happening varies from brand to brand. So the industry standard is to pack two parachutes, your main and your reserve, so that in the instance that your main parachute fails, tangles, or tears, you have a backup that will save your life. But to be clear, that backup chute still needs to be deployed at the right altitude. And unfortunately for this man, he simply did not have enough time for the reserve parachute to save his life. This is Nathy Odinson, and he was a recreational skydiver and base jumper in Thailand. And on January 29th, 2024, he decided to do another base jumping stunt in Thailand. He wanted to jump off a 29-story building, all while having the stunt filmed by his friend who would jump right behind him. The video begins with Nathy Odinson smiling and checking all of his equipment before jumping off the building, and little did he know that this was going to be his final stunt ever performed in Thailand. In the video, you can hear Odinson striking a tree and then striking the ground immediately after he jumped off the building. Quickly after striking the ground, his friend called the police and the paramedics pronounced him dead at the scene. An investigation into the tragic incident has been launched and police suggested that the parachute merely malfunctioned while Odinson's brother blamed user error. Odinson's brother would go into detail about what he thought went wrong. He said it was simple user error. Looking at the video, any skydiver would immediately tell you what is wrong. He would go into detail about how the pilot chute was thrown improperly, which caused Odinson's chute to not open properly. You see, the pilot chute is meant to catch the air and guide the main chute to make sure that all of the air could be captured and you could safely float to the ground. Nathy Odinson did not have enough time after jumping off the building to deploy his second chute. After the main chute failed, Nathy Odinson was already halfway down the length of the building giving him almost no time to deploy the second chute, and when he hit the ground, he died instantly. It's the most present molecule in our atmosphere, the seventh most prevalent element in our solar system, and it's colorless and odorless. Those are the descriptors of the element nitrogen. Humanity has been able to utilize this element in many, many ways. One of the most notable ways that we use nitrogen is in fertilizer, and is wholeheartedly the reason why there's nearly 8.2 billion people on this planet. But in the realm of chemical engineering, elements like nitrogen have multiple uses, both positive and negative. And recently, there's been a new use found for nitrogen. And this man, Kenneth Eugene Smith, has become the first test case to prove the utility of nitrogen hypoxia. Historically, the United States penal system would have multiple different ways of capital punishment, whether that be hanging, a firing squad, electrocution, lethal injection, and of course, inert gas asphyxiation. And the final form is how Kenneth Eugene Smith was executed. They used inert gas asphyxiation. 
It's a form of asphyxiation that results from breathing in a physiologically inert gas in absence of oxygen or a low amount of oxygen. Examples of physiologically inert gases are helium, argon, nitrogen, and methane. And since 1995, many people have been pushing for this type of execution, specifically with nitrogen. Many believe it to be more humane than a lethal injection or electrocution, and it wouldn't be until recently, as of January 25th, that somebody would actually be executed with this method. And the first person to have the opportunity to experience this way of death is Kenneth Eugene Smith. He was born July 4th, 1965 in Alabama, and he's a murderer. On March 18th, 1988, Kenneth Eugene Smith was paid $1,000 to kill a woman. Her name was Elizabeth Sennett, and she was found with fatal injuries in her home in Colbert County, Alabama. Kenneth and another man broke into her home and murdered her. They then trashed her home to make it look like a home invasion and left. When the police entered her home, they noticed that it wasn't a typical home invasion and it absolutely was a cover-up. But there wasn't really any evidence of Kenneth being there, and the police were running out of leads. Until someone anonymously called them through Crime Stoppers, saying that Kenneth and another man were responsible for this woman's murder. A search warrant would be put out for Kenneth, and once they searched his house, they found a voice recorder that was stolen from Elizabeth's home. From there, Kenneth was arrested, charged, and found guilty of murder. The judge specifically gave him the death sentence because he was a murderer for hire, and he would remain on death row for a long time, appealing his case, attempting to stay the execution. But on November 17th, 2022, his attempts at preventing his inevitable death failed, and his first execution attempt occurred. But this execution attempt was botched. He was going to receive the lethal injection, but they couldn't find the vein to inject. They ended up damaging his collarbone, and because of that, his execution was postponed to a later date. That date being January 25th, 2024, when coincidentally, nitrogen asphyxiation as an execution method was finally allowed in the state of Alabama, and Kenneth's execution was overdue. So they picked him to be the first person in Alabama to be executed with this method. The nitrogen gas was administered for 15 minutes, and Smith was officially pronounced dead around 25 minutes. It appeared death occurred around 10 to 15 minutes following the administration of the gas. When movement of Smith ceased at 8.08 p.m., 11 minutes following the activation of the nitrogen hypoxia system, some witnesses commented that Smith looked as if he was conscious for several minutes and thrashed violently on the gurney, breathing heavily for several minutes before breathing was no longer visible and he was later pronounced dead. Hello everyone, it's your boy Aelorus, aka Panadaddy, and I hope you enjoyed today's newest installment of the r slash morbid reality series. This video series is one of my favorites to make, so I am very happy that you guys are enjoying it. The comments, the likes, and overall engagement on these videos have made sure that they've appeared in other people's recommendations, so I can't thank you guys enough. Continue to do that so that many people can enjoy these videos as well. And as always, I thank the Patreon supporters that make content like this possible. A big thank you to The Lord of War, Caterhoof, Behemoth Enjoyer, The Fungi, Tim Killian, Convicted Poop Slinger, Dawnbreaker Drake, Traffic Racer 124, Fisherman, The Blurred Star, Mr. Sandman, Ironic PFP, Mike, Sleepy Dragon, Power Lover, Loving Tate, Tron Destroy 23, Co Connor Purvis, S16, Infrared, My Golden Experience, James Tucker, BMX30, Cinnamon Sticks, The Fake Musician, Samantha Bellhart, Bloody Hunter, Keeley, Dunder Nass Hawk, Swiss Patreon user, and Noah. Thank you so much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. And if you want to help support the channel, there's two links in the description, one of my merch store and one of my Patreon. Both funds go directly into the channel so you can maintain what's happening here. And as always, stay zesty.